one of the only Tesla repair shops in the entire world. You've had multiple run-ins with the FBI over the years. Hey, all those stories about Elon sleeping on the floor, sleeping on the couch, those are true. Welcome back to the What's Inside show or the What's Inside podcast. I am the host, Dan Markham. I'm also the host of the YouTube channel that we've had for six or seven years called What's Inside, where we cut things open, see what's inside of things. Inside of this podcast, we see what's inside of the minds of some of the most interesting people that I think in the world. And we also share the behind the scenes of some of the videos that we've done where we've gone to unique places, seen what's inside of things. If you didn't know this about us, we do like Teslas. They crushed me! And specifically, we like the Tesla Roadster. I have two Tesla Roadsters, a blue one and a red one. And when I say Roadster, a lot of you people that don't know this, Tesla is a lot more than the cars that you see on the road today, like the 3, the Y, the S, and the X. It originally started with a little car called the Tesla Roadster. They took a Lotus body that they bought from, I think, England or somewhere. They converted it a little bit, but they put a battery pack, an electronics module, and they put electric car in there. That's when Elon first came onto the company and said, I want to be part of electric cars. Essentially, they built this car and they're like, this is kind of a mess, but we learned everything that we need to learn in order to go and now make the Model S. They barely survived. They barely made it. They only made, I think, just north of 2,000 cars. But because of that car, Tesla is the multi-billion dollar company today. But it is the forgotten story. It's the forgotten side story of Tesla that I think the majority of people have no idea. With that introduction, today's guest is Carl Medlock. And Carl is one of my good friends that we've gotten to know each other through the Tesla side of things. Because once I got my Tesla Roadster, I learned that it is a car that Tesla does service in a way. They're getting better at it. But when I first got it, they didn't service it at all. They had nobody that worked on the Roadster. They basically put everybody on Model 3 production. And um, I learned about Carl Medlock's shops called Medlock & Sons up in Seattle, Washington. Today I came to Seattle, Washington to see one of the only Tesla repair shops in the entire world. Since then, I've shipped my car up there, had it worked on. I've gone up there and seen his shop. We have Carl here in the studio. We just did some work on my Roadsters out back. And we're going to just ch chat about some of the stories about Tesla, the early days of Tesla and some of his experiences, because there's some of the things that people don't know about this forgotten time. So anyway, with that introduction, welcome to the podcast, Carl. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to be here. And uh, thanks for coming all the way to Utah from Seattle. I like Utah. It is nice. I didn't know I liked Utah, but I do now. <laughs> it's good. It's sunny down here. It's yeah, not as like, like cold as it is up there. Okay, so walk me through a little bit. When did you start at Tesla? Uh, what part? May 9th, 2009. Oh, you remember the exact day. Had they, they hadn't sold any cars at that point, right? They were just delivering. They had sold a bunch, but they hadn't delivered very many. So how, how did you even decide, I'm going to go work for this electric car company? That's kind of a funny story. I wasn't didn't even know Tesla existed, actually. Yeah. So I... Uh, was a car dealer and I was doing really well and then the 08 economy hit and I was actually doing better because people were losing all their $40,000 cars and they were picking up my $10,000 cars and $2,000 cars and I was selling out of inventory every month and I thought this is the best oh, thing that ever happened God. to me. Okay. And, uh, and then October 2008 hit and then it got really, really bad and for a lot of people, I wasn't one of them and uh, the phone rang and it was uh, Matt Giambrono from Tesla Motors. And he says, asked me if I was interested in going to work for an electric startup, car company startup. And I'm laughing at like electric car. <laughs> yeah. I said, who are you? The things have really hit rock bottom now. <laughs> I said, who are you? <laughs> and I was making um, substantial money, so I wasn't really that interested. And um, kind of we kind of tabled that for a second. And then he called back in January 2009. Uh, yeah, 2009. And uh, asked me again. And by that time, I had sold out of inventory. I didn't have any cars to sell. I had 15 cars that were sold, but I didn't own them. I couldn't find them. And I'm actually sitting in my pickup, headed for Portland, Oregon to go pick up three cars just so I could make good on some orders that people had made. And uh, the phone rings, and it's Matt Jim Bruno. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I shut the key off to my truck, and I sat there and talked to him for a couple of hours. Oh. And I had Googled Tesla Motors by then. I still didn't think there were anything worth talking about. <laughs> but I thought, you know what? I'm going to go bankrupt doing what I'm doing, and this sounds like a good time. So they invited me to San Carlos, California, and I went down there and interviewed. And and then uh, ran into a guy I worked with in 1998. Was what fun. was your job like when you went down there? Was it like in the service department? Is it what? I was hired to be a regional manager. Um, actually, I don't know what my title was, actually. It probably changed a lot. 
It did. A few what times. exactly did you do when you first, like, what was your first year? Cause this is the first roadster is, is it the t- 2008, but really they really didn't take delivery in 2008 of a lot of them because they had issues. So really it was like 2009 is when they started actually delivering some of these roadsters. The first car hit Seattle in about February, 2009 and nobody really knew it. It actually belongs to us Senator, hmm. um, Mark Mullet, it's been 68 and he, uh, great guy. I didn't know the car existed. Um, but my first year was like my first month. So Tesla, you you hit the door running and you pick up speed from there. It's uh, it was probably the most dynamic and, and fun job I've ever had. It was, um, but it was also exhausting. The first year, I um, well, the first they shipped me VP thirty one, and there VP, weren't enough. What's VP? The validation validation prototype. Validation prototype thirty one. Okay. They, they sent me validation prototype number thirty one, and they had a sales guy in Seattle. And uh, they didn't ship a charger with it. It had the 110 cable. And if you've ever charged on a 110 cable and... It takes uh, like 30 hours. Yeah, in a roadster. But they had three appointments a day set up for the sales guy. <laughs> you can drive it out of the parking lot and back in around the parking lot. It, it, it kind of went like that. So uh, this guy, super dialed in guy, left his job at Porsche after 15 years, can work for Tesla. Hmm. And I was storing the car at my place and he was picking up doing all of his test drives and I was charging it, but we didn't have enough charge. And... Uh, he ended up not selling enough cars because he didn't charge enough and he lost his job. Oh kind of a weird gosh. deal. So, okay. and then we got a, then we got a 220 charger and I installed it because Tesla wasn't, uh, didn't have any uh, buildings in Seattle. We used my old repair shop for that, hmm. for Tesla service. So we serviced the cars there and, you know, it's kind of fun when, uh, I would work on a certain individual's car. It was, a, used to own a ball team in Seattle and has since passed away, but I'd work on his car and I had 24 seven security. I didn't really know it at the time, but I kept seeing these suburbans with these radar domes on the top of them. And I think, and that's cool. That's cool. I wonder what those are about. They would just bring the car in and you'd work and on it? For, and until the car left, I had 24-7 security. The Suburbans had radar on them? They had a dome radar on the top of them. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Because you've worked with, I mean, early on, it was like movie stars, senators, super successful people that would go and spend $150,000 on an electric car that's like a little Barbie car and is not the most comfortable thing, but it, they're just like supporting the future. This person has a house that's like 24 car garage. And what... How early was their VIN number, the car that they had? It was a below 100. It was a signature 100 car. Okay. So the first 100 are like the signature series or founder series or something. Okay. Yep. Sign- signature 100. I used to go to his house all the time and uh, check the car out. And um, I preferred to go there than to get the car out of the property because the garage that this park and had a granite floor with about an inch of clear on it. A and granite he- floor in a garage. Oh, yeah. It was insane. And there was $100 million worth of cars in this garage. What? So... I, you know, I was lucky, lucky to go there, but you know, you take your shoes off and, uh, <laughs> in a garage. Yeah. And it was the, the worst part about working on the car there. It was exciting and bad is I had to actually take fleece blankets because moving blankets would scratch the floor. I took fleece blankets and laid it out whenever I had to change any components in the car. And I laid the parts outside on the fleece blankets <laughs> and then could go back, um, and finish it up. And it was, uh, he treated me so well. He was so nice to me. So he just had fancy, a lot of cars and then just decided, I want to have a roadster in my garage. Yeah. I mean, he had crazy things like the last one of everything. It seemed like, um, you know, he had a Enzo Ferrari that had the only one ever made with, uh, the race motor and I think it was 1200 horsepower. He started up for me one time and I just was smiling and he just he goes, "Never mind, you don't need to say anything else. <laughs> okay. So early days, did you ever meet the, the man, Elon Musk? I met him a lot, actually. He was, uh, you know. People think he's, because he's so big today, he was a regular guy at the office with a desk like everyone else. He didn't have a fancy desk. He didn't have any special anything. Mm-hmm. You know, and he was, um, he's very dynamic, very smart. His mind's moving really fast. And, uh, you know, he had a vision and he stuck with it. I, I admire that guy for what he's done. Would, I don't know when he came on. He came on in probably in like 2007. He came on before I did, two years yeah. before I did. So before you did. So because early on, I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that when it comes to the Roadster, yes, it's kind of the forgotten car, but I kind of feel like Elon himself has chosen to forget about it. And from my little knowledge that I have, I think part of it could be because he came on when they were already generating, building the Roadster. And so the Model S is really like everything in that, that was him in a way, like he had his hand on everything where the, where the, the roadster is kind of like, all right, this is what I have to work with. Let's change some things. But I don't know that he was super happy with the way that it turned out. I think, uh, if, I, don't, I can't speak for him, but I, I've come from the outside in and watching it all grow. I kind of think the roadster was a little bit of a pain in the butt because I mean, it was never supposed to be the, what it was. And they, it developed into an electric car and nothing really fit into place like it was supposed to, like a normal car would, or like it is the Model S is. 
um, the cars were super, super, uh, the early cars were super, super robust. They just, they overbuilt everything. So one of the things Elon did was make those cars affordable and so they could actually break even on them, on the first cars. Because if they were going to lose $25,000 or more on the first production because of all the military grade everything on oh the car. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Mark Eberhard and Mark Tarpening are the ones who, they, it was it was overdeveloped for the most part. Yeah. Um, fantastic. I mean, those cars, cars get beat on daily and never, they don't hardly ever break. One of the things I learned from this car, this was shocking. I bought the car. Actually, I think it was right before I bought it. Um, I was talking to the guy that I bought it from. His name's Thomas, super cool guy. He lives down in Dallas and he is like the biggest cheerleader for roadsters in the world. Seriously, he, he, he is so passionate about it. They're, they're like his kids. And so one of the things he told me though, is he's like, you always need to make sure you have a charge in it because if you ever run the battery to zero, cause some, you don't drive this thing all the time. It's really low to the ground. Whenever you're driving, you're in people's blind spots every see i never realized how big a blind spot is until i was in this car and i feel like i'm a motorcycle like i'm about to get run over every time i go out i have to dodge cars like they talk about defensive driving that's what i'm doing when i'm driving this car oh my gosh i feel so dangerous right now if we both die the kids i need the kids so you don't drive it that often and you know of course you don't want to put miles on it it's this beautiful car and now it's a collector's thing but if you run the battery to zero it is bricked it's dead like you are done and, it, and that's what he told me. I'm like, I, I bought my first one for around like 50 or 60,000 from Thomas. And he's like, yeah, if you run the battery to zero, it's going to cost you 35,000 to get a new battery in it. And I'm like, what? That is scary. So is that a, is that like one of the most common things that you see in your shop where somebody's like, I've got this roadster. It's a great shape. I've had it forever, but it won't drive anymore. And I don't know why, or the battery's dead. Yeah, I bought five of those since January, since January, since five January. bricked roadsters, five brick roadsters. But the reality is most of them are pretty well cared for. You know, the people who have forgotten about them. The one thing the uh, Roadster has that is a problem that I believe is it doesn't restart charging. So let's say you have a power outage at your home and the charging stops on the car. It, can't, it doesn't have the ability. It's not smart enough, in my opinion, to actually restart charging. It was never part of the, the uh, yeah. firmware. So the cars, people think, well, it's plugged in. It must be charging. And they don't check on the car and it goes dead. <laughs> and so, yeah, because there is a storage mode. And you just think yeah. you put it in storage mode, you put a cover over it, and you're good. Yeah, but you no. think that. But it, the worst thing you can possibly do is use storage mode because, it, believe it or not, it actually drains the battery down to 10%. So if the thing does have a power outage or you do have a power outage, you actually end up less time to save it than before. What's the difference between the Tesla Model S, Model Y, Model 3, those type of batteries where you run it to zero and you just charge it back up? And then why are the Roadster batteries so weird? It's not like you, I get it's like a Duracell battery. Once it's dead, it's dead. Is that That's like, like 1650 cells? It's not the battery itself. It's the, the battery management system. So what the Model S does is it actually shuts down all the technology. So the on the Roadster, it has what they call battery monitoring boards and they run all the time. It's constantly trying to balance that brick or that sheet. And the Model S doesn't do that. It shuts off. When you shut off, it shuts the battery off. Model S can sit for six, seven, eight, 10, 12 months, and it won't go dead. A Roadster is good for about 90 days. Hmm. Okay. So let's go back to Roadster days. You're working at Tesla like a year or two into it. Was there a moment when you were like, this is going to be big or this company is going to be, I mean, it's hard to imagine what it is today, but was there a moment when you're like, yeah, this is a success. This car is doing well. Well, the, all it took was my first auto show to go to. And I was so excited to go to these things. And I went to the Detroit Auto Show with uh, Colette Niasman. She was the director. I don't know what her title was at the time, but she ended up becoming the director of marketing. But I, I would go and be her person that she would go to, or you know, I'd bring tools in case something broke. I was kind of that guy. And then I would just—I was so excited. I would stand on there and talk to people about the cars as well. The Detroit Auto Show. I was speaking. They were actually tracking this. I was speaking to 90 people every 120 minutes. Oh my gosh. So I'd get on the, they call it the people mover and go back to the Marriott Hotel from the, wherever the event center is in, in Michigan. And I, uh, I would just stare at the wall. I was so tired. I'd never <laughs> been so tired. But that was the moment that I realized that this is huge because there were so many people talking to us and excited about it. How could it stop? Wow. What kind of things do they ask back then about electric cars? Because I'm sure it's changed. That's, that's funny that you uh, brought that up because the, back when I was driving VP31, I didn't have a lot of cars to fix. You know, there wasn't anything to do. And uh, two cool, cool stories with that. One was um, my boss called me. There was a recall. The hub some bolts were loose. No big deal. So I met this um, owner in Seattle, and he said, well, there's six uh, roasters really around in my neighborhood. He goes, why don't you just come to my house, and uh, we'll fix do all these cars. And I said, uh, okay, well, I'll show up. And I showed up there, and it was my first experience with roaster owners. 
So of course they have a USB flash drive that they sent me to do log files, which I didn't know log files were. Hmm. It was my first ever, you know, rodeo, so to speak. And I go to this guy's house and I, the flash drive won't work to pull logs. And it was required that you pulled log before you did the repair and after you did the repair on every job. And that was a requirement from Tesla. And you had to upload the log files. My log file stick wouldn't work. So this guy knows I'm incompetent. And he looks at me and he goes, let's go in the house for a second. Let me see that stick. So he's a programmer. And <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, say, he, he, he looks at the flash drive. He goes, oh, they left, they left this, this out, this left this out of the, out of the drive. And I said, okay. So he fixes it, walks it out and hands it to me before we go out of the house. And I go out and I do my job. And, and everybody, every, I think everybody thought we just went and used the restroom because it was, he was that fast and fixed that. And then, uh, when I was driving VP 31 around, there wasn't a lot to do other than those six cars. And people would ask me, where do you put the gas? And I would say, it's all electric. Where do you put and they would the say, gas? well, where do you put the gas? And I said, no, it's no, it's really, honestly, it's all electric. Oh, so it's a hybrid. Where do you put the gas? <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. I said, well, here's the gas door. And they would open the charge port door and they say, it doesn't take gas. And I said, yeah, that's right. It doesn't take gas. Wow. You're like, yes. I did. I, bet you, I answered that question several thousand times. <laughs> where do you put the gas in the electric Because Tesla car? was unknown, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the other thing, people would, you know, think they were being snarky and they'd say, oh, nice Lotus or whatever. I still get that when I drive it. There's this Lotus driver that drove by me the other day in his beautiful brand new yellow Lotus and he saw me. He was like being all cool. He was pretty young. He was like in his 20s. And then he and then he looks over and sees it and he's like, ah, like waving, freaking out. I don't think he even know and he's a Lotus guy that that was a Tesla. What's funny to me today is how many, how many Tesla owners don't look at a roadster and go, when did they make this? There's so many. <laughs> I it, Okay, so I made this comment to my friend the other day that it actually makes me a little sad that when I'm driving down the road and there's a Model Y and a Model X and I'm driving by them and the people don't notice at all. Like as if it were me, I remember, I'm, before I got the Roadsters, it, I saw one like once or twice in the wild and I lost my mind. I'm like, that is the Tesla Roadster. That is the unicorn right there. And those guys, I'm just like, aren't you grateful for where you come from <laughs> when I look at the right. people? The grandpa, don't is that you? you? Don't you know that you wouldn't be here without this little tiny car right here? When we've gotten together, you always tell me like the craziest stories. I'm just like, how do you, I don't know how you have all these stories. So one of them I wanted to talk to you about is, and I vaguely even remember it. And I don't even know if you can't share this, it's okay. We'll skip right, it. Let's try But there's one you told me about, you've had multiple run-ins with the FBI over the years. And one of them specifically, which was not like run-ins, like he's in trouble for stuff and that you've done stuff, but like where you're helping with some random case. And it's so random. The one of them that you told me about was an airport one. I actually bought a car when I was a car dealer from the, the uh, and this actually changed policy. Um, I bought a car at the Seattle airport uh, that was abandoned at the Seattle airport and it was an Al-Qaeda drop car. You, this is the car you're talking this about. This is the one I can that tell you told. Story. Yeah, I you, can tell this okay, story. There's... I forgot what you're talking about. <laughs> so I buy this 1994 Honda Accord. It's that teal green color, 93, teal green color. And I put it on my car dolly. It didn't have any keys. I, I lay it underneath it and I kicked it neutral. I had a winch on my car dolly. I drug it home and I left it on the street. Wasn't thinking nothing about it. So wait, so how did you buy it? This was like an abandoned it was, car? It was abandoned tow yard. It was and in a tow yard. They... So okay. there's a tow yard in Seattle that it was called airport towing. I don't know if it still is. And they would get the, they had the contract for the Seattle parking garage. Oh, okay. And people just leave their cars at the airport and they got to get them out of there and at some point. And if any car stays in the same parking lot for any extended period of time, they'll actually yank the car. Which is interesting because I have Sentry mode on my car and I was parked at the Las Vegas airport when I went out to do the Mercedes shoot like a week or two ago to see the EQS. And it was triggered a few times and it was always these airport employees coming around. I don't have a front license plate and they would walk around to the back of my car because I was parked up against the wall and they'd look at my license plate and record it. I think that's the same thing. They like, they check every car to see how many days it's been in there because they may need to tow them. So this, this car, um, I couldn't, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an expert. I can get into anything and I couldn't get in this car. I call my locksmith guy, Bob, Bob's locks. I call Bob and he shows up, he unlocks the car for me and he goes, Hey, check this out. So I open the console up and it's got this, um, Samsung, I think it was a Samsung phone in the console. I turned it on. It's in Arabic. And Whoa. I thought, and I thought, huh? So I went inside, you know, I'm a podunk, nobody car dealer. Right. And I'm thinking, well, I can sell this phone for whatever I can sell it for. <laughs> and so I, I go in the house and I look it up and then you can't, I learned that you couldn't switch the software in the phone. Once it was built for that region, it couldn't, you couldn't switch the software. Okay. So that phone was junk. Yeah. So, so and then, um, then I opened the glove box and there was a couple thousand dollars in cash. And, um, How much did you buy the car for? I paid like 300 bucks for the car, maybe 400 And then bucks. you're like, a few thousand dollars, we made it. Yeah, so I've already got my money back, right? I'm thinking, this is, this is awesome. <laughs> so the, the cash was in the console. There was a couple cameras in the car. There was a laptop in the trunk. But 
I have, I had just so happens to have uh, one of my uh, ex-wife, wife at the time, uh, one of her best friends with the house, with the house and her car had an oil leak, and she was an ex-federal prosecutor. Hmm. And she had friends in that realm, right? So I handed her the cell phone and said, hey, check this out. She looked at it and she goes, let me make a call. <laughs> let me make a call. <laughs> so we opened, the da- we opened the glove box and there were baggage handler bag uh, badges in the glove box. There was a, I think it was like a- airport employee baggage. Airport, yeah. Um, I think it was Menzies. Menzies it was, uh, anyway. Uh, so there was two badges in the, glove, in the glove box. And in the trunk of this car was a Giorgio Armani suit, it was, there were six piles of clothes, laptop under the middle pile. This and is like Jason Bourne, like the Bourne identity where he's well, got I, like all these different identities everywhere. It's like five passports, gun, well, <laughs> at, the, at this point, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a, a, a low, low level car dealer, right? So all these look like jackpots to me. And I'm thinking this is fantastic. <laughs> I can flip this. I love that. <laughs> so I, Coming uh, from a storage unit guy, I, I can appreciate it. So there's this brand new laptop. I'm making score. You know, there's cash score. There's a phone score. <laughs> but then I ran across these uh suits that went with those badges and that's when it became a problem so a couple of fbi agents showed up super nice guys we're taking the car i looked at the gun and i said you're not taking anything and you know these guys are like it's national security i said i don't care <laughs> i'm keeping the car <laughs> this is my property and i said well we'll take it but we'll give it back to you it's like no you're not so I mean, I really was didn't have a lot of money at the time, and I went into the house and I said, so drug this FBI agent in the house. I said, look at my bank account. You're not taking the car. <laughs> Let's pull up my <laughs> bank account. <laughs> so he uh, anyway. So they took the laptop, which I got back later. Um, the, the strange thing about that laptop, that laptop was actually stolen out of another bag from a girl that came from Alaska. She was headed to Portland, and that that was just something that one of the guys, the back, the one of the shady baggage handlers, whoever was involved with this, they actually had stolen a laptop and put it in the back of this car. Okay. The phone was definitely Arabic. They got all they gleaned. This, I don't. They never could have paid to tell me anything. So they kept. They didn't tell you exactly what but was going on. The, what the end result of all this was, they had to actually taken and processed those badges, and they figured out that people had been piggybacking on badges. And what that means is, let's just say you have a badge, and there's four people behind you. You scan your badge, and everybody follows you. Badge. Everybody follows you through. But what happened because of this is there's no more piggybacking on badges anywhere in the world in the United States. Whoa. So it was a pretty serious thing because these badges actually have been used to get into the airport. And then from that point, you don't know where they went once they're in the airport. Yeah, and I, of course the FBI didn't tell me any of that stuff. What no, year is this? I think they, they had a, uh, it was 2008, seven, seven or eight. Rip. Hmm. Yeah, so that was then, that's how I met these guys. And then I ran across, you know, because where my shop was located and I called it the armpit of Washington State. <laughs> um, it seems like a nice place when I'm there. Yeah, well, because I put flowers everywhere, it seems nice. <laughs> But if you, you know, you looked at the crime map and we're pretty, you know, we're pretty up there in crime. Which is kind of crazy because you've got these beautiful roadsters that are just sitting out in the dirt. And, and you know, we're just part out. of the neighborhood now. The people, the neighbors all love us and we just get along and we don't have any crime. I haven't had anything stolen in 10 years. Knock on that wood. Where's yeah, the right. wood? There we go. <laughs> that was fun. So that was how that car went down. And then I, and then I had a few other things that, that just happened to pop into my lap being in White Center that, you know, child trafficking, uh, girl walked up to the shop, said, can you help me? She was 15 years old. Oh, my gosh. She was stolen out of a uh, football game in another state. And then the next day, she got it home. Got her, got home. The next day? The next so day or the day after. The next day you talk. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, had two of those. Had two oh, similar man. cases with that. And then, you know, I just... And because I had that first initial re- relationship with them, or I met them, I guess I don't really have a relationship with any of them, but I met them because of that, I had somebody to call. And I made the call, and that's just what I felt like I just needed to do, so I did it. That's interesting. Okay, so let's change gears over to, there's multiple FBI stories, by the way, and there's even some related to electric cars that are fascinating, but a lot of it we can't talk about, so we're not going to talk about it. But there's, that's interesting. I do, that story is interesting, just buying a car, especially for somebody that buys storage lockers. I love the hustle. I love flipping things. But let's switch over to like the current state of electric cars, because obviously you deal in the old versions, but we've got a lot of new players coming out. We've got, I just did a video on the Mercedes EQS. I did one on the Hummer that's coming out, but then there's other companies, two companies in particular I'm thinking about that we're all curious about, Lucid and Rivian. And I'm wondering if you have any take on these companies and what your thoughts are about Will they be successful or what? from what you've seen behind the scenes? I, I have a different perspective than a lot of people. A lot of people just like the pretty and they think people will just fall in love with it. But the truth is, I think that the manufacturer with the best service is the one who's going to win the game. Um, you can buy, build all the things you want, but if nobody is there to fix them when they break, nobody's going to like you. 
Yeah. It's just going to be a consumable that people throw away and get another one. Or they don't get they get a different brand. I think um, you know I I look at the people I worked with at Rivian uh, at Tesla that work at Rivian, a all star. That's really yeah. If you okay. have an all star baseball team, it would be those guys. So there's a lot of Tesla former Tesla employees that are at Rivian. Well, every name I see at Rivian is somebody I know. Interesting. Okay. Which is kind of odd, actually. I'm just like, mm-hmm. oh wow. Uh, and I still have all their cell phone numbers. I'm like oh, this, <laughs> I feel like pranking them, but I haven't done it yet. And then uh, Lucid, all the original sales team from Tesla. The oh, back to 07 are at Lucid. Hmm. And those are top notch, classy. I mean, you look at the way that the marketing of Lucid is going. They're doing such a fantastic job with Their this. marketing's great. It, it seems like this high end luxury car. I haven't really seen it much. I feel like when you have the Amazon backing behind Rivian, and I've seen a lot of the testing that's out there that they've been doing, like, it seems like they're going overboard on the testing, which is going to help them in a lot of ways. I think they're going overboard on the, and I'm just speaking from the outside in. I right. have no idea what they're, right. what they're really doing. But it seems to me that all that service team that went was working from Tesla is not working at Rivian. They're like, test it some more. You know, let's get the let's get the bugs worked out now instead of making That's the smart. consumer the guinea pig. I'll be honest, and it's documented on my YouTube videos. Like the service at Tesla was not great. It's gotten a lot better with the app, with everything. People come to my house now, but it was bad. And we published some videos that did not put me in a good light. In fact, side note that a lot of people don't know is that I published a video about Tesla service where one day my charging port would not open. And, and basically as soon as it wouldn't open, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to document the process. There's been a lot of complaints about Tesla service and how it works. Let me just document it. So I filmed it. I'm like, check this out. The charge port doesn't work. I call Tesla on the phone and they're like, yeah, you need to um, do this, pull this lever. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, we'll send somebody out. Or no, no, no. Then they just said, we can't work on it in your small town. We need to get it to the service center. So we're going to get a tow truck to come out and you don't have to pay for it. It's great. So they come out. I filmed the tow truck taking it. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Tesla. I'm watching this thing. It's the dead of summer. It's 115 degrees in Las Vegas. And my car only had 70 miles charge already. But every day it's just creeping down, creeping down. After about a week... And what's weird is when you tow a Tesla, it still shows the original location of the last place you drove drove it. So even though it was in Vegas for a week, it still said that it was at my house in the app. So I'm like, I know they haven't gotten in and even tried to turn it on. So nobody's touching it. It had like 11 or 12 miles left. And I'm like, this is not going to be good for it. So I called and I had sent a couple messages, no response. Turns out, long story short, is they took my car and they didn't the guy that dropped it off that night he put the key in the box the tow truck guy did but what tesla had as a process at the time is every day they'd close out all of their orders for the day in service and then they'd start fresh the next day they closed out all the orders not not thinking that my car was coming and they closed out the one of my car so then when they saw the key they don't admit what happened to it but it sounds like to me somebody just saw that key and was like huh and just got rid of it put it in a pile random key instead of going and checking it out not my job that's what i was thinking was happening the, the manager there said he didn't have a key. He's like, the tow truck driver must have never given the key. I talked to the tow truck guy. He's like, I put the key in the box. So anyway, a little discrepancy. But once that happened, the manager was really good. He fixed it within a day. It was great. They were helpful. And then he told me, thanks for identifying this because now we know there's an error in our process and I've pushed it up the chain and we're going to change the process moving forward. And so I feel like the last three years or so have just been Tesla changing their process over and over to refine it, to get it better based off of mistakes they've made and people complaining about stuff. The bad part is, <laughs> and I've never said this in a video or anything, but that video I think was like 15 minutes long. That was the first version of it. We did four versions. We kept cutting it. We cut it down to like 10 minutes, maybe nine minutes. And we did, we took out like most of the call with the employee on the phone. We just like took out a lot of things so they couldn't identify who the employees were. I don't, I don't want the employees to get in trouble for me making a video. Well, we accidentally uploaded the, the actual main version with all of it in there. And I felt really bad about it, but I didn't feel bad enough to take it down because by the time I realized it, like five hours in, it was already at like half a million views. And I'm like, oh, I can't kill it now. <laughs> so anyway, Tesla's done a better job at changing that. But um, the thing that I feel like Mercedes Benz has on Tesla and Lucid and Rivian is that they've been building gas cars for years. They know how to make the interior. They know how to make the, the gaps in the body good. The thing about Mercedes Benz that I hated in the past is that we used to have a car and it would, we'd always have to fix things like the knob would break and we'd it's a thousand bucks that year. And like every year there's like $2,000 worth of stuff to fix. And so hopefully their service is going to be better now that it's electric. There's not as many parts, but I do worry, like you said, about Rivian, Lucid, 
how good is their service going to be? And maybe that's what will win the day. And you know, the funny thing about Tesla and their service was, you know, because Tesla didn't ever want to be a car company. I was actually in a meeting one time where um, they said, we're not a car, we're not in the car business. We're not a car company. We're a software company that built a car. Or Even I, back then they were saying that. I can't remember exactly. Because I know that now they've been kind of saying, that's what people lean toward. They're like, this is a software company. And that's what like ARK Investments, all these investors are saying. They're like, you don't realize the value because they're a software company. Well, somebody popped off in that meeting and they said, uh, you know, I got news for you. It's got four tires. It's got brakes. It's got a steering wheel. We're in the car business. <laughs> I never saw that guy again. <laughs> never saw that guy again. <laughs> I've heard stories. Okay, so I've heard stories that like it, it, that's kind of the way Tesla is. Where in some ways it's helped them progress, but in other ways it's like if you're not with us, you're against us, and it's really easy for people to just get pushed to the side. I thought that was really brutal in the very beginning, but you know if somebody is not on your team, then get them off the team, because the reality is Tesla was going to you know like Elon would point off into the distance and say we're going that way, and you're either going that way or you're going out. And that's yeah. and the reality is if you're going to, you know, once he's made his decision, your input is over. And some people kept talking and that was the end of their talking. Um, but the truth is when Elon makes a decision, that's the direction we're going to go. And if it works, fantastic. If it doesn't work, he's going to make a change and we're still going to keep going in a, in a certain direction. Yeah. I used to think it was brutal, but now I think it's smart. I think it's smart to be able to get rid of the cancer right away. Yeah. If, I mean, other car manufacturers, if they have unions, they can't do that. Right. And yeah, no wonder he's so against unions because... If he wants to get rid of someone, he's got to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, and it takes a lot of a lot of processes and stuff. I'm, I, yeah, I don't, I don't. I've heard a lot of negative things about unions, but I don't, I've never been in one. So Tesla Roadster values. What do you think this is going to happen? You're hearing the buzz. I would think from you have like car collectors in your ear. You've got CEOs of companies that originally had the Roadster that still have them, or senators. And I've, I would think now that Tesla is becoming such a big company, and people are realizing that hey, this is the first ever car. Is, do you see the values continuing to go up on these things or what do you see for the future, the next like five years or so? I see the value continuing to go up and, and here's why. So in the past, there have been car collectors, all gearheads, gas heads, petrol heads, whatever you want to call us, that collected cars. We knew everything about a 67 Camaro, Shelby Mustang, all that stuff. Okay, well now enters a new collector, okay? Those people that are software engineers, uh, tech types, doctors, they weren't, some of them weren't, into gas cars. They don't care about that. Yeah. But these software engineers are now looking at buying a collectible car because they want to keep a car. And the only thing out there to collect is this one so far. So they're paying huge money for these cars. And I think they're going to continue to go up in value. I don't think they're going to hit, I don't think anytime soon they're going to hit a million dollars. But some, I think there'll be a few five ten roadsters out there that are going to hit a million dollars. Um, but I think in the, for long term, they're going to continue to go up. They can't do anything but go up. There's less of them on the road. They brick, they die. And I buy them all. I hide them. You, I mean, that's the thing. Like parts are hard to come by. Not anymore. And I've, so I've got all that sorted out. You've got a lot of parts, but it's like because you buy wrecked roadsters. There's one that hit a tree or hit a telephone pole, and you're, and throw it goes up to auction for like fifteen thousand dollars. And it's you buy it, and you're like, all right, I've got some parts. <laughs> that's what happens. I was buying. I bought that one for twelve. Um, the uh, <laughs> for twelve. <laughs> twelve. The. Uh, I manufacture most of the body. I manufacture all of the body except for the bumpers. So I don't need any body parts. That's mm. all cool. Um, electronics are all repairable. We can do that. We're actually um, making some new boards for some of the pieces in the car because the boards are uh, the air aging out. And, you know, there just is a limited supply. There doesn't need to be a huge supply of parts for these cars because there just isn't that many to supply. Yeah. But we're making most of the pieces. Yeah, it's going to be a problem, but I, I have 30 years in the industry. So I've seen rare cars my whole career and how hard it is to find parts. I am an expert at digging down a rabbit hole until I find the piece I want. And now I know where all those horses are. Yeah. I, I mean, found we had a car that was our roadster where they were doing service on it and like the, they were driving down the freeway and they, they were doing the wrap and everything. And like the actual emblem on the front came off like the old school Tesla logo. So I asked Carl, I'm like, oh, what do I do about this? Because all these cars ran it over and it was so dented. He's like, I've got one brand new in the bag. Brand new logo, ships it to my house, put it on the car. There's nobody else in the world I could have called to get that. <laughs> I, I, know what, I know what pieces, there's a lot of pieces on those cars that are really difficult to get. To get. And I have sense. Once I, once I figure out there's a, there's a low quantity of something, I either buy all of them, which is what I did with all the wheels, um, the wheels. <laughs> um, buy all of them, or you uh, just wish you had bought them all. Does Tesla ever come to you and say, hey, can we buy some parts from you? We want to service roadsters. Not directly. 
but they have um, there have been cars that I've heard to wear in service centers that the owner have called me and asked me for pieces. And you know, if Tesla wants parts, I'll sell them to them. I'm not a, I'm, I mean, I'm not a hoarder. Well, yeah, I am. I have, <laughs> I have two 26 car trailers full of Tesla Roadster parts. Oh my gosh. What, how is Tesla? Like, do they reach out to you ever and like talk to you about stuff or are they just kind of like, you're doing your thing. That's great. We're doing our thing. Well, I think because of the original CNBC C video where I told them to go F themselves, they it kind of, uh, okay. So maybe I, sh- maybe I missed that part in the video. Oh, is you, that, did? you said that in the video. So they sent me a C, <laughs> well, it's kind of a funny story. Actually, they told me that I wasn't qualified to work on the cars. So uh, they sent me a cease and desist from my repair shop. Whoa. And at that I time, I was still pissed off of being fired. So I was like, I wrote, go F yourself on the em- on the envelope, return to sender. And I knew my mailman really well. And he just laughed. He goes, okay, bud. <laughs> no way. And I sent it back. To, and, I, and I literally put the, the lead lawyer for Tesla's name on the envelope. Attention, Philip Rothenberg. Go F yourself. And sent it back. And you know what? I never heard from Tesla again. Oh, my gosh. They were like. It's, it's, it's one of those things where, like, if you had a shop that was like, Tesla service and it looks super official as far as like the outside. It's Medlock and Sons. You're doing a service that Tesla doesn't do. I remember back when they built the Model 3, like te- Elon called it. I was at the launch day and he said something like, the, the next six months are going to be production hell. Is yep, what he I remember called that it. too. And he pulled everybody off of everything and he was sleeping in the factory. They literally were two weeks away from going bankrupt. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't invest because I could tell that things were not going good. They came out of it and now they're just like, I'm a dummy for not becoming a millionaire from it. But um, they, the Roadster people, they they want to have people that work on Roadsters, but it's just hard to find people that want to do it. And there's hard to find enough business and enough time for them to do it. I think that's true. I, you know, early on when the in 2012, when they were setting up the factory for the Model S, it, all those stories about Elon sleeping on the floor and sleeping on the couch, those are true. I remember him cleaning off. I don't know if he cleaned it off. But I remember walking in there at like 6.30 in the morning into the factory. That's a 5.5 million square foot building, okay? It's 1.4 miles from kitty corner to kitty corner walking into the building, you know? And it's 3.6 miles to walk around the building because I did it. <laughs> you know the exact numbers. So, <laughs> but in the middle of the factory in the engin- on the engineering tables was the lead engineer, um, director of engineering, I think it was his, his title. His deck was cleaned off. All that was on it was the monitor. And there's Elon's sleeping on this desk no yes middle of the guy the guy was put his money where his mouth is he literally slept in the factory and you know what he wasn't prideful he wasn't anything and he got up and he went to work and i thought man lead by example i better work a few more hours yeah i don't i can't imagine there's that many ceos that could walk into an engineering meeting or a production or a supply chain meeting and have any input that is even helpful to these experts but i feel like elon can walk in the room of any department at tesla and either have significant input or ask enough questions to all of a sudden become an expert and have significant input. Yeah, in about six minutes. He's really sharp without, about that stuff. You know, the one thing I used to tell people is like, you know what, you may be smarter than me, but you'll never outwork me. And then I met Elon and I saw him sleeping on that desk and I thought, man, game on. I got I to gotta step up the game. <laughs> you know, because he was there when I left that night, the night before, and he was there when I got there in the morning. I thought to myself, I got a good night's sleep. I went, I went to sleep at 10 o'clock. I have no idea what time he quit. What's weird is that he doesn't sell his shares. He doesn't, he just sold all of his houses and moved to Texas. He's like minimalistic guy putting bit cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in the company. And all these people get mad at him like, oh, you should be giving more money back to the government because you're so successful. And he's like, I don't really own anything. Like he, I'm, he has money, I'm sure. But he doesn't take his Tesla money out and like sell it. You don't see him selling his shares. They have to report that. And so it does feel like it's some sort of strange, this is my life's mission to build the electric cars, rid the world of emissions and stuff. And then also, I just, I still don't understand the Mars thing. I'm not, I don't understand why I understand that you want to like have humans on a different planet in case the earth goes away, but it seems like a miserable place to live. (laughs) I don't want to be on that ship. I think it's more for him. I, I, I don't, of course, I'm not speaking for him, but it seems like he has this goal. He has this thought. And he goes, you know what? I wonder if he can do that. And then some, and then some idiot tells him, "You can't do that." And <laughs> you then can't Elon's do it. like, "Challenge accepted. Perfect. We're doing. <laughs> Let's it. do it." Yeah. I, I mean, some of the stuff I'm hearing about that he's doing now is just over the top. I mean, the Roadster was over the top. The electric cars are over the top. Now they're mainstream. Was there was there anything while you were working there that you were thinking, "This is over the top. I don't think we can do this." 
and then well sometimes that it. was payroll because tesla was <laughs> <laughs> i get payroll okay that's good uh, you know I mean, sometimes you know tesla was bumping a little bit bumpy for a while you know i was at the ipo i wasn't at the ipo event itself i was actually there for support and i was at the new york uh, service center at the time but i was there on the when they did that and it, sometimes you, you just those are the milestones that you just look back and you think yeah that was just a photo at that time that was just a photo opportunity that hopefully we could stay in business for another six months wow you know, and I remember when uh, the Roadsters at the very end of the production was not selling that well, so they actually went to Bank of America and got a lease program. Hmm. And I don't know how many of them got leased, but, you know, that was a way to sell cars. And I don't know what the goal, his goals are, but he's going to get to every one of them. Yeah. That's what i something. Learned. I know that I've been like, oh, I'm such a big, big Elon fan. There's definitely a lot of things I like about Elon just because he's, he's, he's like the Albert Einstein of our day today. Does he do everything the proper way? No, <laughs> but he gets stuff done and he's, and he, and he's helping humanity. It seems like in a way, and he's really good at memes on the internet. So I like Is he? that. He's, he's so good at memes. I've never seen one. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so he loves memes. Um, he was on this one app called clubhouse the other day and he was talking about memes and he said, he said he has a meme, what did he call it? Like a meme employee or something? A meme dealer, a meme dealer, that's what it is. And it's somebody that sends him memes. It's like a friend and like that's his job is to send him the funny memes of the day. He's like a little kid, I love it. I do too, I mean, he's, he's definitely a battle, you know, he'll, he'll take you out if he needs to. But for the, for the most part, he's just very dynamic, very smart, he's funny. I mean, when you see him in his, in his element, he's funny. Yeah. You know, in the 2010, um, Christmas party. He had all those kids there, and you know he wasn't a Tesla leader at that point. He was with his children. Hmm. It was a Christmas party, and he had he was hanging out with his kids. And I just thought to myself, "You're all right. You're That's all cool. right." And then I stayed in the Fremont Marriott Hotel for six months straight in the Fre Fremont, California, and I would see him at breakfast, and he would just do his thing and be with his kids. And you know, I admire the guy for the dad he's trying to be. He's really with the busy as he is, good for him. I wonder often if his kids have watched my videos. So I know Elon's watched him. I don't know this because they told me that, but I've published videos and within two weeks, the company has made the specific change that I mentioned in a video. It's happened multiple times. But I did notice after my service video, I think that was a side story I was saying earlier, when I did the service video and showed all that stuff, I kind of got on the blacklist at Tesla. Like, like the Cybertruck event happened, no media invite, know anything i had to have one of my friends that's a huge investor that gets a lot of spots and he asked his friend that worked at the company that's in charge of the entire event said come on though it's dan it's dan look at all the referrals look at all the good videos he makes it's his videos from the launch event are the best ones of all of them and she's like okay i'll do it i'll get him in but anyway so that's how i got into the cyber truck event that's a dark cloud i've been in that i've been in that particular dark spot you're talking about where you're like outer darkness it's like you're all of a sudden you're just out and i'm like dude look at all the stuff i've done i didn't think i was getting the roadster the dex gen roadster for the while it's a two hundred fifty thousand dollar car i earned one and then one hundred and ten thousand dollars off the second one finally i need to make a youtube video on this but finally i got an email you saw it i called you i'm like they told me i don't get it i'm now ineligible and i'm like this is elon sticking it to me going out of his way is so many important things to do but yet he will take the time to go out of his way to be like make sure that person is uncomfortable and doesn't get anything. <laughs> what I think Elon should do is go out of his way and give me all the, let me buy all the roadster parts and take over roadster service. I'll take the burden off his, off his plate. I'll take care of all those things. He knows I can do the job. He may not like me, but he probably respects me. Oh, yeah. And I know he watched the original video of us from CNBC because he actually tagged the minute where it said, my son said we got fired, but it was political. But you know, they know who we are. Elon actually, from Elon on YouTube, actually quoted that exact time, and all he said was, we know who you are. <laughs> he never said anything else. That's funny. Thought, well, welcome to the party. All right, Tesla employees, Elon Musk, if you're watching, Carl Medlock, best in the business, fixes the roadsters, keeps them alive. There, This roadster would be even more dead if it wasn't for your shop, because there's things that happen to these roadsters that you would just say, sell this. I'll get, I'll give it to somebody for $10,000. I'll just unload it. I don't want it anymore, but you can go in and fix it. And then all of a sudden you have a car that's now super valuable and on the road that you still love. So anyway, Tesla, come on, let's, let's make the service center great again. And I think we need to, I don't think they can do that from inside help. And that's not the point of this podcast, but it's, I'm it's, just saying. It's just not really that important for the roadster to be, I mean, it, it needs to stay alive but it doesn't necessarily need to be Tesla to keep it alive. Because I mean, it's really, it's a burden on service centers. They don't have the support staff. They don't have the parts. They don't have the technology because those cars are really dumb. 
So yeah, they're yeah. really slow, and I don't know. I want it. There's my sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. So anyway, we could go on for hours and hours. I think there's so many interesting things. Check out Carl Medlock, Medlock and Sons um, on Instagram. We'll put a link down in the description. Do you guys have a YouTube channel? We no? do. You do? Okay. Yeah, we'll put a link to the YouTube channel in there. But but essentially, if you ever want to learn about the Roadster or you have a Roadster, you're thinking about buying a Tesla Roadster or you want to sell one of your Tesla Roadsters, like it's not like an official dealership reselling these things, but it's good to sell it to somebody that understands how they work and can make sure that when it's resold to somebody, it's in a good shape so that when they get it, they will continue on and enjoy this car. Because I really want the legacy of Tesla Roadsters to live on for a while. And I think the only way to have that happen is if they are pro properly maintained and taken care of. So anyway, Medlock and Sons, Carl, you're awesome. Thanks for joining the podcast today. And uh, we might have to do this again sometime because there's so many stories we haven't even included yet. That there's are so more years. Yeah. Well, I'll come up to Seattle. And we'll do something up there. A lot of stories. A lot in of the backdrop of your 22 roadsters you have in your shop right now. So <laughs> anyway, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm not sure how Spotify and Apple works. I think you can do notifications. So it downloads all the podcasts for you. We also have our what's inside show podcast channel on YouTube where we do video clips of the actual podcast and then in the entire podcast on there. So anyway, thanks for listening. I've never seen underneath a roadster before. Big old plate under here. Um, I, you know, I like blue. Look at this blue color. That is nice. I'm starting to feel that my red and blue roasters are not all that unique because it seems like there's a lot of them. This color is not that common. This color is less common. This is Ven 203. We're doing a sound reduction package. These cars are inherently noisy. Let's fall into a Microsoft executive and it was been sold a couple of times. This car's back now after about its third owner and we're gonna do sound reduction material. A lot of the noise in this car comes from right here.